Hello, and a very warm welcome to this evening's webinar. This evening, we have a very exciting discussion with a deep dive into the Cairngorms Connect Partnership, a uh, bold and ambitious 200-year vision that they've got to enhance habitats, increase biodiversity, and revitalise natural processes across a vast swathe of the Scottish Highlands. We'll be finding out more about what's going on in this project, and I'll be asking a few probing questions about what's going on as well. My name is Hugh Webster. I'm the Digital Communications Officer at Scotland The Big Picture, and I'm delighted to be hosting this discussion this evening uh, with our panel. We've got two members from Cairngorms Connect who I'll be introducing to you directly, and a member of the local community with us as well who'll be giving us her thoughts about the Cairngorms Connect project. So starting from the far end of the table first, uh, we've got Sydney Henderson. She is the Communications and Involvement uh, Manager at Cairngorms Connect with responsibility for communicating all of the good stuff that happens in the partnership uh, and also responsibility for involving people in the habitat restoration work that takes place with the help of the Endangered Landscape Programme funds. In the middle here we've got uh, Jack Ward. He is a deer stalker employed by Cairngorms Connect and he also leads their venison project and he'll be telling us more about the influence of deer across the landscape and his work in managing their impact. And next to me, uh, last but very much not least, we've got Wendy Sylvester. She's the hospitality manager at Balangine Mountain Lodge. And she's going to be giving us some insights into her perspective about what Cairngorms Connect means for her business, uh, for her guests, and also for herself. So without further ado, uh, we'll dive straight in and I'll come to you first, Sydney. Uh, maybe you can just give us a bit of an overview about Cairngorms Connect Tell us about the project, a bit, a bit about the scale and what it's trying to achieve. Yeah, so Cairngorms Connect is a partnership of neighbouring land managers, um, Wildland Limited, RSPB Scotland, Forestry and Land Scotland and Nature Scott with the Cairngorms National Park Authority as a supporting partner. Um, it came about in, um, I think, 2014 when these neighbouring land managers were gathered around a map and realised that they were all delivering really similar work, looking at large scale ecological restoration right next to each other. And it just made sense to work in partnership to build this collaboration and, and landscape scale approach to their work. Um, so they weren't anymore working in kind of isolation just on their own land, but working at the landscape scale, um, which resulted in, in Cairngorms Connect. Um, it's a 60,000 um, hectare ecological restoration project, roughly around three times the size of Glasgow. So it is the UK's largest ecological restoration project. Um, and as well as being large scale, we're also working very long term. So we're working on a 200 year vision for restored ecological processes, enhanced habitats, uh, species and ecological processes. Um, so it's really large scale, it's really long term and it's taking a lot of work, which we're excited to talk more about.
So you talked a lot there about um, ecological restoration and restoring those um, ecological processes that um, we want to see in the, in the landscape. But I think it's, it's, I'm right in saying that it's the case that the Cairngorms Connect um, partnership has been a little bit reluctant to date to take the lead on reintroducing apex predators or to talk about reintroducing apex predators to this landscape. And that's obviously a topic that a lot of people are interested in, some people keen, some people a lot less keen. Um, could you tell us a little bit about why Cairngorms Connect is not keen to tackle that uh, as part of their immediate work? Uh, and also maybe speculate, if, if you're comfortable, um, about what it might take for them to consider that in the future. Yeah, great first question, straight in with the heart hitting, that's great. Um, so yeah, so, so as I mentioned, Cairngorms Connect is a partnership, um, and as a partnership there are differing views between the partners around introduction of apex predators, for example, lynx. Um, it's something that not all the partners are comfortable with. Some of the partners are fully supportive and, and would be interested in exploring it, but some of them not so much. And as a partnership, we have to work together and you know, look for those shared common goals to drive our vision. And I think the, you know, the differing views within the partnership is something that makes it quite strong. It means we're able to cover this huge amount of area and kind of challenge each other and work to make the partnership the best it can be. But it does also mean that in some cases, the partners don't always agree on everything. Um, so that's kind of the first reason really is it's, is it's a partnership and it's not something that the partnership agrees on. Um, secondly, there are quite a lot of um, assessments that would need to be done before an introduction of links would happen in the Kengels Connect area. So there's the IUCN assessment, um, which is, you know, the, the area would have to be reviewed for, through a variety of assessments to see whether it's suitable for links and equally habitat impact assessments. Um, and these are processes we've gone through with Wildcats, which are now going to be released in the partnership area this summer. Um, and it's a process that hasn't happened for links in the partnership area. So while um, you know, we can speculate that it might ecologically, it might be a suitable um, location for links introduction, it's not something we know before we've done these assessments. Um, and I guess lastly, it's as a partnership, um, there is obviously the possibility that partners may change their opinion and may change their perspective. So I would say that it's you know, not something that's completely off the cards forever. And if partners' opinions and positions did change, you know, it is something we're open to. And I know at Scotland, the big picture, um, and people like Dave, the he David Hetherington with his book, The Links and Us, are doing really interesting work to kind of look at the case for links reintroduction in Scotland. Um, so it would just be a case of you know, keeping informed with the evidence, um, which we are. And, and seeing if there is a, a shift within the partnership. Um, but for now, yeah, it's not something we're looking at. Brilliant, okay, thank you very much. Um, so Jack, if I come to you with, with a second question. Um, we know, uh, or I know because I read about it, that uh, Cairngorms Connect protect, protects the largest contiguous fragment of Caledonian pine wood that is left in Scotland. Um, but as I understand it, the project is not all just about wildlife. We, we started off with jumping in on, on sort of the apex predators theme, because that's often the one that comes up first, but it's about uh, more than wildlife, the, the partnership as a whole. And, and one of the sort of topics that I understand is focused on is, is carbon as well as, as wildlife. Um, so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how deer influence both those things and, and your role in, in all of that. Yeah, of course. So I think it's always, important to say that deer are a really key piece of the puzzle. Um, we don't want to get rid of the deer, we really need the deer, they do a really good job. Um, they're seed vectors, uh, they break up patches of woodland to make it more open, um, and they are really good at recycling nutrients. They eat nutrients in one place and they deposit in them in another place. So we really need that to take place, which is why we don't want to use fencing. The issue comes from the fact that deer do that job really well when they're at the right levels. And what we see throughout Scotland <coughs> and the rest of the UK is that deer numbers are significantly higher than they should be. So all of a sudden those impacts which are actually quite beneficial become far too great. And it means that the forest cannot regenerate because all those little saplings that grow through that need to be thinned are entirely obliterated and there's just nothing to regenerate. That's similar with peatland. So peatland obviously forms very, very slowly and it's protected by a layer of vegetation on the top. Now, when the deer are on there grazing consistently all the time, it breaks it down, but also just their weight and their trampling can have a really big impact on that. Once that opens up the surface, the peat is then very, very vulnerable to erosion through weathering, and that can then carve away and we start to lose carbon. 
So the peatland itself is actually giving off carbon and the trampling further accentuates that because they physically break it. Then the vegetation can't recover because the, the peatland edges are too steep, which is what we call a peat hag. Um, so it can't be colonized by vegetation. Similarly, we've got woodland which isn't regenerating, so that's not drawing carbon. So you then have a vicious cycle that goes on. Through managing the deer, through stalking the deer, one, we lower the population, we lower the density. So it means the time um, between deer impacting an area is greater, so the area can start to recover. And also those impacts are lessened because there's fewer animals doing it. Now a certain amount, I'd say, is quite good. A certain amount of uh, soil disturbance is great. It allows seeds to get in there. That's what we're aiming for. So as we lower those deer, uh, forests start to regenerate. Instantly they start sucking in carbon, which is great, but the deer are still allowed in there to keep it natural. The peatland needs a little bit more work because as I say, those steep hags um, struggle to, to recover themselves. So there's been a lot of practical work up there of people grading off those sides to make them gentler so they can be revegetated. In some cases, people are revegetating them and also re-wetting the ground, blocking the ground up to re-wet it. And we've seen that happen throughout the project area. Um, on Glen Feshi, Glen Tromi, Killy Huntley, this is all owned by Wildland Limited. It was sporting estates um, prior to their management, but just since they've been doing that work, um, I've got it here, it's, it's quite impressive. Um, just by reducing the deer population, um, there's been a reduction of 88,000 tonnes of carbon um, that is being emitted, which is absolutely massive. Now, further than that, there's indirect emissions, which are up to 220,000 tonnes of carbon, which have, have been reduced. And that's because of the regeneration of the ground. So there's been over 2,000 hectares of woodland that has been allowed to naturally regenerate, which is great. Um, and then as well as woodland, it's also the other habitat. So it's grasslands and heathlands, which are also really key. They've also improved. So there's about 11,000 hectares of habitat there. So in terms of carbon, it's happening on multiple different levels um, through the deer management. So that's really key. But like you said, it's not just about the wildlife. It's not just about the carbon. And the people are really key to that as well. So we want people to know the work we're doing and hopefully get the direct benefits from that. So that might be flood prevention because the peatlands are holding more water, so there'll be less flooding downstream. It'll be cleaner water because the water is sitting up on the land, it's slowing down, so all that sediment is dropping before the water slowly flows downhill. It's quite normal around here. We know we have really peaty locks. We know that when you swim, you can't really see your feet. And it's normal, but it shouldn't be normal. The reason it's there is because the peat is in the water. It shouldn't be in the water, it should be on the hill. When you go to comparable areas, say in South Nest, or South, Southwest Norway, the water is really clean because the peatland's being held where it should be. And that's what we want to get to. And I'll cover a little bit later about some of the science we're doing to monitor that. So we want the people to see these benefits. We've also got the Venison Project, which you touched on, um, which is about trying to get local people to really benefit from that resource that's coming from the land as well. And also directly through employment. So I'm employed through the project, which is great. I'm actually one of nine stalkers throughout the project area, which are directly employed to stalk deer. Plus we have in um, the winter, there's five contractors which are employed throughout the area and we're now employing a trainee role. Um, so we've got entry level careers really for people. So that's just directly in the deer um, stalking. So it's, it's a really good project. Brilliant. I mean, it's fascinating to hear. I think that narrative that you talk about with the deer having an effect on woodland, I think that is one certainly I'm familiar with and I think the general public are increasingly familiar with, but you talk about all those other benefits and particularly the sort of the effect on peatland as well. I don't think that that is such a well-known effect that, that deer are having these negative effects on peatlands, which we, we, again, there's growing awareness that peatlands are so vital for carbon storage, aren't they? And even talking about the health of grasslands, it's really interesting to hear about that wider effect and then the community benefits and, and the employment. Sometimes you, you hear people opposed to the sort of deer control work that um, can take place in restoration projects, saying that it's getting rid of jobs. And from what you describe, it's, it's creating them. And, and that's brilliant. So maybe before we move on, could you, could you tell us a little bit more about the, the venison project specifically, and um, maybe convince our listeners about why they should uh, be seeking out uh, venison as, as sort of the most ethical and sustainable meat choice? Yeah, definitely. Well, the, the venison project sprung up 
off the back of our deer management. So we're not out stalking deer and shooting deer to produce venison. We're out stalking deer for ecological restoration. And the venison is an output of that. Now, most of the venison is sold to the game dealers, which then goes to restaurants and hotels. It might go abroad. What we really wanted to, to do is get that venison to stay a bit more local. As I say, the project is about people. It's about including people and getting people connected with their land as well. So if we can sell our venison affordably, if we can sell it locally, either through um, shops such as the Lock Garden Nature Centre, through businesses such as uh, Ballantine Mountain Lodge, or through events like we did a Hill to Grill, it means that people can, can get that. They can see that it's come from their land because every time we sell venison, it says the location where that deer was shot, even to the point where we can put a grid reference on there. And I've had people ask me um, when this deer was shot because they can see that grid reference from their house. And that's great, that's what we want. We want people to appreciate that that's coming from their land. And not only that, this is great venison that's coming from their land. So they're getting a really good product. product. It's completely sustainable. It's the highest protein of any red meat. And that's only because um, the health of that venison is because it's coming from a healthy landscape. So you asked about trying to convince you it's the right type of meat. It's, it is the most ethical form of, of getting meat. Now, a lot of the time, the ethics of shooting an animal come into question, and rightly so. People should be concerned about an animal's welfare. And I can say, without a shadow of a doubt, that that is not only mine, but all the other stalkers in the project area, that is our number one concern. Now, it sounds a little bit kind of counterproductive, but all the stalkers in the project area are qualified. We're all experienced. We all do training. We all do shooting tests. And most of the time, the deer doesn't even know we're here. So it's a very swift, um, way to kill an animal. A lot of the time people will criticise us because we shoot year round, whether it, it varies on different species and males and females, there are closed seasons, but we're always out there having an impact in the, in the environment. Now these are prey animal, they should be predated year round. In wolves, and lynx, bears, they, they don't get to June and say, oh, we'll give them six months off. They should be, and that's what drives the behaviour. They should be alert, they should be mobile, they should be moving through the environment, and that's what we see. Now, one, that's one way of thinking about the welfare of the deer. There's also lots of other factors, and that's what I like. So all the data um, that we gather when we shoot a deer, well, that's all collected. So we've got thousands of samples of data. We've got a really big sample area. One thing we see is the weights of the deer increasing. So when you shoot in an area and the population density comes down, the weights of the deer go up. We see that time and time again. Now using yearling deer, so that's deer that are just about a year old, is a really good indicator of that. I'm talking predominantly about red deer here because that's largely what we're dealing with. We see the weights coming up and that's purely because they have greater access to a wide variety of food and they have shelter all year round. And similarly, we have much lower mortality figures when we have hard winters because the deer are in a better state and they can, they can make it through those winters. So that's one way of recording welfare. Another way of recording welfare is um, the fecundity of the deer, or the pregnancy rates of the deer. Now, typically what we see in Scotland, it's what we use our population models um, to plan future deer management, is we, we use 33% roughly pregnancy rates. That's what we expect to see from a population of adult red hinds, the females. Now, in some harsh winters, we've seen that drop to as low as about 12% because the hinds are struggling, they're not in decent enough condition, so they'll abort that fetus to look after themselves because they're more important. In the same years that we've seen some areas drop down to 12%, our pregnancy rates were 68%. So that's massive. That's double the average, let alone the low years, and that's only possible because the deer are in good condition. The females are a high body weight, they're in good condition because they've got lots of food, they've got lots of cover and they can make it through. Now a lot of people say well that's not great for our management because it's producing more deer. It is but it's producing it because they're healthy and they're in tune with the environment. That's what we want. We want the healthy deer so it's harsh on the deer that we have to shoot them but the ones that are left are in a far better state. So that's what we want to see. Now, just jumping back to the venison, I'll just quickly go through some things. It, it's, as I say, it's the best meat you can eat. In terms of carbon, it's brilliant. As I say, we try and keep it locally, sell it locally, sorry. So we keep the food miles very, very low. One example is we sold to Ballantine Lodge. 
Um, it was actually shot on Invereshi, which is owned by Nature Scott in the project area. And as the eagle flies from where it's cooked to where it was shot, it was less than five kilometers. You can actually see the location where it was shot. So that's great. One, there's low food miles, but two, you can really link that in with the guests that are eating it. You, they're gonna go to that place on their retreats and see the management, and they get to taste that as well. Another example is the venison we sell through the Nature Center at Lock Garden has a total food miles of 7.7 .7 miles. That includes going to a local butcher who gets paid to butcher and package it for us, which is great. It then comes back to the center where it's sold to members of the public. So it's really low. That coupled with the fact that we're managing deer, we're producing healthier woodland, which is drawing in carbon. So potentially it's a carbon positive food. And actually it's studies that we're looking into to try and prove that. And as I say, in terms of a red meat, it's incredibly healthy for you. It's the highest protein of any red meat. There's about 26 grams of protein per 100 grams, which is higher than any other. Um, it's also low in cholesterol because it's wild, it's lean. Um, farmed beef has about 300% more cholesterol in it. So it, it's healthy in that way as well. And finally, it's the best red meat for omega-3 fatty acids, which everyone knows omega is really good for you. It's actually the, the highest level of omega-3, it's about five times that of beef, and it has the best ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acids. Now, not only that, we know that the amount of omega-3 in meat um, varies on what that animal has been eating. So animals that have been fed on a manufactured pellet have the lowest levels of omega-3, Pasture-fed livestock has a higher level. Wild-fed animals have even higher again. So the fact that the deer here are eating an entirely natural diet, it's varied and they can shelter, means their venison is actually healthier. So this is why I always say a healthy habitat produces healthy deer, which produces healthy venison. And I could go further and say that produces healthy people. It's, fasc it's fascinating. I, I can tell this is your, one of your favourite, maybe your favourite subjects. But uh, I think when you talk about ethics, it's such a minefield, isn't it? And you, you're probably never going to convince everyone and, and there will be people who aren't comfortable with it. But it's, it's interesting to hear the different aspects of the ethical thing that you might not think about straight away, about the fact that the animals are in better condition as a result of the fact that they're being controlled in this, in this regard. And, the, the carbon positive nature of it and, and, and all of the health aspects as well. There's a, there's a lot of different angles to, to, to the ethical side of it and, and their condition is really interesting. Brent, well, Jack's talked a little bit there, Wendy, about the, the community uh, aspect and keeping the food really local and supplying local suppliers. So maybe you could um, uh, tell us a little bit now about uh, your experience in your hospitality business and um, the demand that you experience from customers for, for this amazing product that Jack has just done a, a good selling job on. <laughs> of course, our guests are not only looking for locally sourced food, they expect it. Um, and they've got particular interest in Scottish produce because we have got a lot of guests coming from uh, the States and Canada. Um, last year, uh, a few years ago actually, we had a change of menu completely to make sure that most of the produce that we sell is served, sorry, is grown on site or sourced locally. Some items come from further afield in Scotland and some from the UK. Um, we also took the decision this year that we would only serve venison on our menu. Um, and that is obviously a courtesy of Jack at Cairn Gorms Connect. And the reason we like that so much is because um, we can show the guests, as Jack was saying, where the deer was shot. And we can tell them who shot it, the deer. And we can also make that part of our story when we're serving food in an evening. And people love that. It gives them something to talk about around the table. And also they go away and share that with their friends and family. Um, it's just a big part of our story is what we're serving and um, where it comes from in terms of air miles. So um, a huge part of our menu as well is also focused around locally foraged foods. I spend quite a lot of time in the forest with my basket, um, gathering produce, which I hook up with likes of um, juniper berries with the venison and um, like local nettles just now, uh, gorse mushrooms in the summer. And yeah, I guess just really enjoy that whole sort of forest to plate aspect. So Sydney, I'd like to come back to you uh, now, if that's all right. Um, again, going back to my fact finding on Cairngorms Connect, uh, I learned that there are over 180 kilometres of paths around the Cairngorms Connect landscape. Uh, and obviously uh, a, a key port, um, sort of role of any 
large landscape manager and or um, conservation organisation is to secure and provide access to the public and, and make sure that people can enjoy wild places and nature and get all the benefits that we know flow from those things. But we also are increasingly aware that there can be um, problems for wildlife that stem from um, disturbance by the public, be it, be it loose dogs or just high numbers of people. So could you tell us a little bit about how the partners in the Cairngorms Connect landscape um, manage that um, sort of balancing act? Yeah, it's a really good question and um, I think it, it links in with, with things that Jack and Wendy have already kind of alluded to, that people are so key to this partnership and are so key to ecological restoration. Um, you know, not only the 59 full-time equivalent staff that the partnership employs, um, but the, you know, I think it's around 2 million visitors we get to this area within the Cairngorms National Park every year, um, to the volunteers and businesses and local communities that support our work. So commu to people are so key to Cairngorms Connect, and, you know, we wouldn't be able to achieve what we are achieving without them. For me, it's really important to be out in nature for some time every day, even if it's only a very short time. If we can help people to connect to nature, then they will feel better. If I'm feeling low, I just take myself off outside and within minutes you're lifted. It just has this wonderful power to keep you calm. great to, to come to work each day. I mean, it's a fantastic location. You just have nature all around you. For a long time, we've looked to take what we can from, from the land without really thinking whether it's sustainable or not. I mean, Cairngorms Connect is, is important to businesses like mine. It, it directly affects it in that I can employ up to 10 people who are all local to the area. But the project is going to span generations, so there will be opportunities that reveal themselves along the way. Historically, conservation in the UK has been human-centric and small-scale. It's this idea that we're separate to nature and we need to take care of nature and make sure that it stays the way that we want it. Restoring natural processes like Cairngorms Connect is trying to do completely turns that on its head and it restores the power to the natural environment itself. For too long tried to pretend that we can separate ourselves from nature and we absolutely can't because we're part of nature. There's a lot of beneficiaries from the, the project itself, and I'm definitely one of them. The location for me is everything when it comes to my fitness retreats. When people come to the Cairngorms, not only do they want to be involved with fitness, but they want to be part of the nature, switch off mentally and work on themselves physically. Hopefully we can keep building the ecotourism in the area to highlight how amazing the surroundings here are. We belong here, we belong in the hills and the mountains. In this world that we're living today, a world where we're bombarded by information, we need the ability to escape. We have to have that opportunity to get away from all that, even just for short periods of time, and see the, see the real world for what it is. If we can't sustain nature with people in the landscape, then we basically can't sustain nature. I think for a long time, um, humans have kind of 
in the UK have seen themselves as separate from nature and as, you know, these, these wild places which are far and, and out of reach and, you know, not something that we see ourselves a part of. Um, but this more holistic approach of seeing humans as part of the ecosystem and as part of this environment has helped shape um, Kengoms Connect and I know other restoration projects as well. Um, obviously in Scotland we have the Scottish Outdoor Access Code um, which grants rights to responsible access with responsible being the very key word um, because obviously this is an area which is home to some really rare species um, including Capercaillie. So Cairngorms Ken Connect Partnership Area is home to over 50% of the remaining Capercaillie population. Um, so as you mentioned as well, it's kind of our responsibility to make sure this is, as, well, we're trying as hard as we can for the species not to go extinct. Um, and one of the key um, things threatening their, their existence is disturbance. So people kind of with dogs off leads or going off paths. Um, so we've recently, uh, the Cairngorms Capercaillie Project have recently launched a new campaign, Let It Be. We hold for laughter. <laughs> Thank you. Um, which is targeted at um, bird watchers and wildlife enthusiasts um, to encourage them to not go looking for capercaillie during the breeding season. So from now up until August, um, to not risk disturbing the birds at all. Um, and it's this kind of education and informing about what responsible access looks like that I think helps us be a part of this ecosystem, but in a responsible way that doesn't do any harm. Yeah, it's so key. it's such a key thing, isn't it? That realizing that whilst we're all out there and everyone wants to be out there enjoying it, and but you just have to find a way to do that that you're not causing a problem. So, being a flagship restoration project, uh, it's obviously vital that the changes affected by all of the different things that are uh, taking place, uh, the management model in the Cairngorms landscape, that they are monitored and recorded and and that there's evidence of, of the good things that are coming from it. Um, so Jack, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about the science of what's going on at the moment within the partnership and uh, maybe quantify some of those benefits that we've been hearing about already. Yeah, of course. So like you say, it's key. Um, we, we need to know that what we're doing has impact. And if it doesn't have impact, we need to know that as well so we can inform future decisions. Um, we're really lucky that we've got a massive area to work with and everyone who's really willing and lets us do it, which is great. We've got a really good team of ecologists that can get out there and record everything from changing water quality to invertebrates, birds, vegetation, everything else. So as I say, changing water quality. Um, since the peatland work has been um, happening that we mentioned earlier on, um, we have um, systems put in place that we can measure uh, flow rates of the water that's leaving the peatland and um, the, the number of particles that's in that water. So we can see how that changes over time. Obviously, we've got an idea of what might happen, but this is one of the exciting things about working on this sort of scale. We don't actually know, and that's great. So we can kind of see that as it happens. A lot of it's in the early stages. So we are having to wait and see, but five, 10, 20 years down the line, we'll start to get more and more data. Um, a good example of um, a kind of baseline data that we've been recording is um, it's called a seed source establishment trial. So that's basically how trees are naturally regenerated in the landscape. And from that baseline data, um, there was over a thousand, it was about 1,300 quadrats were used a meter by a meter to see um, what was establishing at altitude in remote areas. So between 400 and 650 meters of altitude. And across all those quadrats, only 16 saplings were found and they were a combination of um, rowan and pine. Now that's incredibly low. Um, what we're doing now to, to trial what could work is different levels of disturbance on the ground. So we have plots which are cut out, um, which are all perfectly managed, measured and mapped, and uh, three different types of disturbance, uh, whether it's been strimmed or flailed or left entirely. Um, and then we can revisit those areas and see how seed dispersal and how regeneration is occurring. So we can measure that from baseline for a number of years, which is really great. And then we can link that into the, the various management techniques which are happening in that area. So we'll have really good data. Um, as well as that, at the same time, we've got um, baseline data from other sites. So because Cairngorms Connect itself is new, but the partnership um, has been functioning before that. So the partners have been doing this conservation work on their own ground. So we're not starting 
from, from bare rock. There's a lot of work that's been done. So to kind of almost step back in time slightly, other sites are used. So there's areas in the East Cairngorms where there's some restoration work happening now, but it's much more recent than what's happening in this area. So we can use that to collect um, baseline data. So the team have been collecting data on the both abundance and diversity of moths, birds, and um, vegetation. What we can tell is that the data that's collected from those areas of early restoration suggests that both abundant and diversity of species is lower than what we see in this area. So there's more species um, and there's more of them here. Now to continue that trend we've also got areas in southwest Norway where this work has been happening for a lot longer and we see that trend happening again. So again there there's more species and there's more of them which is great. So that's a really good um, model for us to use. Just go into a little bit more detail in that, there are certain species which we have seen just in the last couple of years appear where they weren't before. So there's moth species such as Cotscone prominent which at lower altitudes are quite common. Um, they need broadleaf species, birches and things like that. But we've started to now get them, the team of getting them on their altitude traps. So this is a really good indicator that that habitat, a broadleaf, native broadleaves, are spreading up the hill, which is what we want to see. So that's really good. So one, we've got long-term changes that we can measure, but all the time we're getting updates. And I say, these are things that we don't know, and it's happening and we can see it happening, which is really, really good. So we've got that happening across the area, but then in more specific areas, Several of the partners do woodland herbivore impact assessments. So, for example, on um, Abernethy, which is RSPB, they've been doing them for the last couple of years. It's a new method, um, so that's why it's not been happening longer than that. And just on first evidence, we can see that because of ongoing deer management, the impacts that they measured in the first year are lessened in the second year. We haven't got data from this year yet because they're currently being, um, being measured at the moment. Um, similarly, Invereshi, who are owned by Nature Scott, have a different method of measuring regeneration through fixed point photography. So it's a really simple thing. You sink a post in the ground, you put your camera on it there, and you take that picture. And you can repeat that really, really easily several years down the line. And then it's a really good visual way of showing people how those trees are marching away. Apart from one where it was actually so successful, the trees come up and block the camera. So we can't use it anymore. Um, but you know, we, we, can, we can deal with those things. But those things are really good. Now, at that place at Invereshi, um, one of the, the hills is called Craig Fierclick, and it's known as being the highest tree line in Britain, and which arguably is. And it's filling out, which is great. I say arguably because now it's actually been challenged by Mila Buckel. So Mila Buckel is the hill that sits between Glenmore and Abernethy. And just since I've been in the area, so I've been here for uh, about 12 or 13 years now, I used to come running down that hill in open ground, whereas now I come down in birches and willows and pines, which have marched almost to the summit and it's 810 meters. So it's not a small hill. So we can see those changes happening as well. I love hearing those stories about um, whether it's moths turning up in places you don't expect them or trees growing higher than people thought the where the tree line was. That's one of the really exciting things, isn't it, about whether you call it rewilding or ecological restoration. It's, it's that process of sort of dynamic change, embracing that and not having a sort of fixed endpoint in mind. I had a couple of questions from what you were saying there. The, you were talking about the flailing and the strimming of the vegetation. So is, that the, is the theory there that the vegetation is sort of too thick and undisturbed for trees to get established? Yeah, that's right. And, and that is because of a lack of sort of large herbivores that would have opened up that habitat where we'd sort yeah. of, we're missing the aurochs and, and sort of thing and wild boar that are really capable of breaking that up. Is that the issue there? We're missing those processes that can break ground up. So obviously when you've got woodland that can shroud out certain areas of vegetation. So a, a, a good example is bracken. Bracken can ramp away across the hills and it can dominate the hill. Bracken's a woodland species. Now I've seen people roll and pull and poison bracken and you can guarantee it's going to come back. The best way I've seen of controlling bracken, and it keeps it back, is woodland. Mm. There's so many places in the project area, you can walk along, you can see bracken glades, and then all of a sudden there isn't bracken there, and it's because you're standing on a lovely big birch tree or a pine tree, and it's just shrouding out those areas. Now underneath, the smaller vegetation can get through, and invariably you'll find rowan sprouting through because the red wing have sat up there in the winter, dropped all the seeds, and away we go. Now areas 
um, where there are no trees, the heathers dominate, the moss layer gets underneath because it holds damp under the heather, and then something as light as a birch seed, which is dispersed by the wind, needs to get in contact with the ground. It's not heavy enough to fall through and break through there. Sometimes we see rowan saplings get away because they come down with a massive blob of fertilizer out the back of a bird, um, but things like birch just can't do it. Now, when you disturb that ground, that happens. And this is why I say sometimes the deer are actually really useful because if you get deer that move in traffic and create a line of disturbance, that's where seeds are going to get in, particularly if we see deer run. So again, it's something we miss in this country because we haven't got the predators to make them run. Obviously, if you walk on the ground, you'll depress it. If you run on the ground, you'll scrape that ground back and running deer do that. So as I say, we want the deer to be mobile because they'll achieve that. And I can imagine that might also mean getting them off their sort of established deer trails if a predator moves them, because if they're only getting seeds established on those established deer trails, I imagine those seedlings get munched regularly as well as the deer are trafficking up and down. But if you've got deer randomly running across the landscape because they're being chased by something, that's a sort of disturbance. That's it, and carrying right. seeds with them as they go yeah. in their hair or in their droppings. Yeah. So the seed trials are carving some of that vegetation out of the way just to see what happens. Right. So you mentioned, um, just to finish up, that um, one of the things that you're monitoring is, is the moth um, changes in abundance and diversity. Mm -hmm. Is that something where um, people, because I think that's something you can do at home, isn't it? Um, keeping an eye on moth trapping and things. Yeah, so absolutely. Is there opportunities within Cairngorms Connect for volunteers or students to get involved with some of this monitoring work? Yeah, so um, the, the ecology team that do this, they take certain people out and say we have volunteers or uh, students and things which will come out. Um, it might just be for a season, they might return for another season and they can A, really help physically put the traps out, but a big thing is IDing. So another project we have is monitoring deadwood beetles. Um, we can see that where deadwood is created, beetle diversity abundance is far higher. But one of the longest parts of that project is literally staring down a microscope, identifying all these beetles. So when you get a really keen volunteer, they can get that eye in and that's a great thing for people to do. Um, you mentioned about people doing it in their own gardens. It's great. And it's part of this whole citizen science thing. Say people are really key to this. And if they are seeing those changes, it'd be great if they could feed that back to us. Brilliant. So it's, it's clear listening to, to you, Jack, and Sydney earlier, what you were saying that Cairngorms Connect places a high value on sort of community buy-in and, and benefits for local people. Um, and I was wondering, um, Wendy, if you'd be happy commenting on your perspective, um, whether what is it that you think local people in particular want from this landscape? Just listening to Jack and Sydney makes me actually want to do a bit of volunteering for Cairngorm Connect if I had time. Um, I've lived in the Cairngorms for over 20 years, um, on and off, and I've got a variety of friends who are here for like a variety of reasons, whether it's bonding on outdoor adventures, um, hunting and gathering like I do to become more self-sufficient, um, using the land for creative ventures uh, or to share and inspire others or just immersive holistic experiences, just losing yourself in nature and reconnecting with the natural world. But overall, I think what people want here is just security, uh, a chance to live and work in an environment that's protected and to be surrounded by so similar like-minded individuals who, s who share the same ethos and morals regarding our environment, how it's protected and how it's managed. So it's a bit of job security that, that jobs are really important for local people in the community, obviously, but also you're, you're talking about a wider sort of security, like an environmental sort of security. Yeah, just to know that the, the place that you've chosen to put your hat down, you know, is going to be looked after and yeah. taken care of. And that's, that's really important to me personally. And I know from my friends and my immediate social group and the people who come to Balanjean, that's, that's a really important factor for them too. Well, I'm conscious I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here with the <laughs> Cairngorms Connect guys sat to your left, but having said all that, do you think that that is something that Cairngorms Connect are working towards achieving? Do you feel like that's something that you see? I do, yes. Um, I'm just starting to learn more about Cairngorms Connect now. Um, I've lived on the West Coast and the East Coast and I've always been drawn back to uh, the Cairngorms. I feel a sense of belonging here, so an affinity with the landscape and the culture and the people. I used to get stressed out in places that I've lived before because you'd look around and see the environment that you were living in, you know, wasn't being properly managed. And I kind of justified that by saying you can't change the world, but you can look after your own patch. But 
the good thing about organisations like Karen Gorms Connect is um, it collectively allows larger groups of like-minded people to work together to create larger uh, scale change which we can all benefit from. Um, for instance, like the healthy forests that I forage in, um, the clear air that we breathe, the water that I swim in in the rivers, and just generally the stunning landscape and uh, adventure that we can all be surrounded when we live and work here. Yeah, that feeling that you describe of um, living in other places and, and feeling a bit mm -hmm. sort of frustrated by looking around at a landscape that you felt wasn't in good health and there mm -hmm. wasn't much you could do, I think that's something that a lot of people can relate to and um, maybe a little bit envious yes. of uh, living in, in a landscape where you feel you look and, and things are, are healthy and, are, and on a sort of better track. Hugely, it's a relief, you know, just to know that you're surrounded by like-minded people, you know, who want the same thing as you do. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, having said that about like-minded people, uh, my next question that I've got lined up is, is just sort of a nod to the fact that not everyone is on, on the same page. Um, and uh, we sometimes hear certain local voices and national voices um, arguing with particular uh, respect to the Kapakali population that um, landscape custodians such as Cairngorms Connect and the partners within it um, should be doing more to tackle the predators and pine martin is one that gets mentioned a lot in order to, um, we talked about the disturbance threat to cappers uh, earlier but we know that's not the only problem they're facing in the suite of problems that this bird is facing and that they do have a problem with predators. Um, so uh, maybe Jack if I could come back to you, could you tell us a little bit about the um, approach of the partners within Cairngorms Connect to this predator issue? Yeah so obviously we're, we're really aware of that and <coughs> um, I don't think anyone, we, we're not dead against culling predators, but we're actually kind of looking at other methods. So on some areas of the project area, before it was Cairngorms Connect, uh, predator control did take place. And actually a lot of corvids and foxes um, were shot um, in the conservation of Kapakali. Throughout that period, throughout the 80s and 90s, um, we actually saw Kappa continue to decline. So it didn't work. We don't fully understand um, what was happening, but we can say it did not work. It did not help Capacale stabilize or increase. So we stopped. So there wasn't the data there to support it. So that's why we didn't carry on. Instead, what we're doing is the predator project. So that's looking at how different predators interact with the environment and with each other within that environment. And a healthy environment should have that, that should happen. We should see predators predating some Capacale. We should see Capacale eating these certain plants and certain invertebrates. So we, we want those things to happen. Within that, the key study is our diversionary feeding study. And this is what we've really been invested in the last couple of years. So it's been led by a student from Aberdeen University. And it involves uh, taking carrion and putting that out during the breeding season um, within different proximity to nests. Now the nests are false nests, um, so we can properly monitor it. And what we're seeing is that when these food deposits are put closer to nests, uh, visitation by predators is less. So the main predators that we're seeing turn up on cameras are pine martin, uh, fox and badger. We've seen things like buzzards turn up on the food drops as well, because we've got cameras on everywhere, but <coughs> actually at the nests, uh, pine martin were the most common. So 30% of the nests were visited by a pine martin. About 20% were by badgers, they were the next highest ones. Of the nests that were visited by predators, pine martin again made up 70% of that, so a large number. But as I say, the, the nests with feed deposits close by, um, I've got it here so I'll get it right, um, with the ones close by, um, 42% were visited. When there wasn't a feed deposit close by, that was 65%, so it's quite a significant difference. And what we can also see is that, particularly um, with pine martins, we can basically halve the number of visitations by a pine martin to a ground nest by using food deposits. So it's a different way of, of uh, monitoring how predators affect ground nesting birds. Obviously we're talking about capercaillie, but it could be wood warblers and willow warblers, it could be curlew, um, it's all appropriate. But this is run for two years, this is the third year of putting food deposits out and then it's into the writing stage and the data is actually looking quite convincing. And you say people have got different um, 
thoughts and methods of this, and that's right, but actually what's happened so far is um, this study has been put out, the early research has been shown to people, and actually seems to be kind of galvanizing people. And even people that have done predator control for a long time and still seen declining po kappa populations are now thinking at this and thinking, okay, maybe that's the way to go. That's gonna be down to each individual landowner um, to make their own management plans. One last key thing on that is that we know um, from other studies that using false nests creates higher visitation by predators than wild nests do. And that's probably because we're pretty rubbish at hiding a nest, whereas a ground nesting bird, A, is cryptic in its behavior, and its nests are far more cryptic. And also that cycles of voles really impact this. So voles are very cyclical. It's about every three years they have boom and bust cycles. And we know from other studies in other countries that when vole cycles are at their lowest, nest predation is much higher because the predators need something else to eat. And when the voles come back up, nest predation drops. The last two years that this study has been run in has been in low vole years. So the, the visitation by predators to the nest is likely to be higher than it will be this year. A, because it's false nests, and B, because it's been low voles. So we're hoping this year, uh, studies have already shown it's gonna be a high vole year. We're hoping we'll see that reflected in the studies. So to be clear, all those figures you were talking about and telling us about there, those are all in relation to false nests, which are nests yeah. that researchers, volunteers, whoever's involved in that project, they are creating those nests. And this is a kappa nest that somebody effectively creates, makes, and puts out into the yeah. environment in kappa habitat. And then it is monitored with a camera, which might be one of the reasons it's sort of easier for things to discover, is it? Potentially, yeah. So there's been a lot of work done to try and minimise human scent because we use our eyes. Uh, a badger functions entirely by its nose. Um, so a lot has been done to minimise that. Um, also, they try to put in natural places, but as I say, there's human error in there. What this study isn't trying to show is survival rates of that nest because we're not taking into account weather and climate or hen abandonment and things like that. It's purely trying to show visitation from predators to these nests. But as I say, what we do know from other studies is that fault nests attract more predators and in low vol years, that also attracts more predators. Yeah. Um, the whole study, I say, it's been written at the moment and then it'll be peer reviewed and published. So that'll be a really exciting thing for people to read, but yeah. they'll just have to sit tight for that. Interesting, looking forward to that. I'm try there are eggs in, the, in this false nest, that, so yeah. there's not, obviously not kappa eggs, but it's a, a sort of substitute egg that is That's to make right. it seem like a real nest. And if it was a kappa nest, there, there would be the, the female bird on, on those nests most of the t on the eggs most of the time. So is that another difference maybe? That yeah, these nests are totally unguarded. Yeah. Um, as well as a, an open nest that the eggs again are, are cryptically marked. But a female kappa is unbelievably camouflaged, right. really beautiful. So when she sits tight, you just can't see it. Now an open nest is more obvious. We haven't got that. So there are factors in play, but I say that's all included in the study. Yeah. I was trying to keep track of the figures that you're quoting, and one of the ones that jumped out at me was it was only 30% that were being discovered of your fake nests. By pine martin, yeah. Um, by pine martin. By pine martin, right. and about 20% by badgers as well. Oh, but as okay. I say, using the food drops, we know that we can half the amount of general predator visitation. Right. Okay, well we'll look forward to that study and those results, thank you. Um, Sydney, I've got what some people might call the sort of $64,000 question for you, just to um, give you another tough one. Um, can you uh, tell us a little bit about why the Cairngorms Connect partnership has been reluctant to bill itself as a rewilding project? Um, and uh, maybe you could also identify where you think there might be some elements of overlap um, with rewilding and the, and the principles that the project is, is um, comfortable with. And uh, maybe comment either in your own capacity or, or, or from the partnership's perspective whether you think that R word that we're so interested in at Scotland Big Picture, uh, is it becoming any less controversial in Scotland? Yeah, really good question and a, and a kind of another hot question I get asked quite a lot. Um, I think the, you know, I work in communications, the words that we use are really important and there's a lot of thought behind why Kengels Connect isn't labelled as a rewilding project. Um, it's, it's another one of those things that there's differing opinions within the partnership, so some partners would probably be quite happy to be labelled as, as rewilding um, and some of them, you know, not so much. Um, but I think, you know, until relatively recently, rewilding has been associated with 
reintroduction of large predators, um, which, you know, as we've already chatted about, is, is not something we're going to do at the moment. Um, so there's, you know, we don't want to risk that miscommunication that Kangoms Connect is looking to reintroduce large predators. Um, I think that is changing, and obviously a lot of the work you do is around kind of education around what rewilding is. Um, and I think it now feels more aligned with um, the pro probably a, a definition that's sort of more European, which is it's more about restoring processes at a large scale, which is exactly what Kangles Connect is doing. So that's one of the areas where it does really overlap with the rewilding definition. Um, we are obviously currently directly intervening with the landscape, um, which whether that's rewilding, I'm not so sure. Um, but we're looking to reach a, a sort of tipping point where these natural processes will take over. So we're no longer carrying out peatland restoration work or plantation restructuring. Um, and these ecosystems and natural processes are just functioning naturally. Um, Timescale wise, um, we plan as much as you can plan that that should be around 2065, that that's when this landscape will be functioning as a kind of healthy, self-sustaining ecosystem. Um, on the yeah, sort of on the word itself, I, th I think rewilding is really emotive in different reasons and means different things to different people. Um, so it's it's sort of hard to comment on on that because it it'll mean different things to each person. Um, and I think yeah, just because it's another one of those things that the partnership doesn't have a, a sort of unified, you know, supportive position on. It's just something we've stayed away from um, and gone with ecological restoration um, or habitat restoration. It's just, it's a, avoids all of that endless debate about what yeah. rewilding is and yeah. isn't. And you, you touched on there about we're intervening. Is that rewilding? Some people would say not really. If, yeah. if sort of if you subscribe to the sort of passive rewilding school of thought, but other people, as you said, rewilding often involves reintroducing things like apex predators, which is by definition an intervention. So the, there is a lot of intervening in rewilding to kickstart things. But okay, I think people will understand the. Um, advantages of just uh, sticking to ecological restoration. I'm interested to hear you talk about that um, timeline there and, and sort of 2065 as the point at which the, um, as far as you can um, predict when the habitat might be close to sort of um, self-sustaining, sort of not needing the inter interventions that yeah. it's. So that timeline and, and, it's, and there are sort of points between now and then, I don't want to think how old I'll be then, um, <laughs> And beyond that point, that, that's all available on the Cairngorms Connect website? Yes, so that's all on our website. Um, we're mainly working towards this 200-year vision, um, which is, you know, seven to eight generations into the future, which is why we do work quite closely with um, local schools and local youth groups to work intergenerationally and pass that on to the next generation. Um, we will all obviously not be here in 200 years, um, so it's really, sorry, spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously it's really important to be, you know, passing this work on and passing this kind of passion and, and connection to the landscape onto the next generation um, to, you know, work at, work at the timescale of a landscape. It will take 200 years for the forest to restore, for the forest to double in size, which is our ambition. Um, and that's just realistic of how long this ecological restoration work will take. So, we've, you know, it's, it's very ambitious and it's very long term and it's very, um, you know, it, it takes, it, it's moving in the scale of a forest rather than in the scale of a person, um, which is what I really first interested me in Kangles Connect as well. Brilliant. So this feels like, a, like whilst we're sort of finishing up with this look to the future, I wonder if I could uh, follow up what you were saying there and ask you, um, is there any sort of um, possibility of extra partners joining the, the Kengons Connect partnership in the future? Is that something that people foresee as a possibility? Um, or if not, or in parallel with that, um, these management principles that are being um, put in place across the partnership, do you see any sort of widening uptake of, of, the, of that sort of approach to, to landscape? management across the wider Cairngorms? Yeah, so um, Cairngorms Connect isn't sort of actively looking for new partners, um, but it's definitely not something we're closed off to. Um, the partnership is guided by a very clear memorandum of understanding, which sets out these um, kind of our visions and our aim for this 200 year vision for ecological restoration. So any new partners would have to, you know, be in line with that vision and you know, commit to delivering this work really long term. Um, certainly there is there's potential to expand um, as long as any new partners would comply with this memorandum of understanding. 
Um, Jack actually told me a really good example in the ride over here um, about the influence of this project on neighbouring landowners, so I might just switch yeah, over so to Jack. <coughs> like Sydney says, we're, we're hoping that it'll, it'll spread out and there are a few examples of estates locally that border the project area that have changed their management uh, practices. They've been in contact with us, the conversations. They've gone from being traditional sport and states to wanting to reduce their deer densities. They wanted to reduce their sheep densities. They want to try and increase their amount of woodland that's going up the hill. They're now in conversation with people from Nature Scott about woodland grouse, i.e. black grouse and capercaillie. How can they help to increase their numbers? They're in conversation directly with us. So we can now work with them to talk about things like access to the hill using their infrastructure or uh, talking to each other across boundary. Um, so we can talk about deer movements. So just that ethic is starting to spread and that's driven by public demand. People are getting more into this and it's catching the eye in media, but also things like the Scottish government is driving um, management of deer populations. So now the God Scottish government wants deer populations to be no higher than 10 per kilometre squared. So they're going to have to bring numbers down. So there's a few different ways um, which is driving the change. Brilliant, thank you. All right, as we've been hearing tonight, uh, the Cairngorms connected landscape is full of all sorts of incredible wildlife. There have been more than 5,000 species identified across the more than 600 square kilometres that make up this largest habitat restoration project here in Britain. Uh, I think it's got the second highest mountain in the UK and uh, one of the largest wetlands in Scotland at Loch Inch. So there's all sorts of things to learn about and experience in this landscape and it truly is a wild landscape in the making. If you want to find out more about the Cairngorms Connect uh, project, I thoroughly recommend you head over to the website. It's at cairngormsconnect.org.uk, if I've got that right. And uh, you can find out many more of the amazing facts and figures about this incredible project. If you'd like to experience this landscape for yourself, as well as discovering other exciting projects fighting back for nature, you can join Scotland Big Picture at our rewilding learning hub in the Cairngorms. Please also check out the rewilding experiences available on our website. And if you want to join us this autumn for a spectacular rewilding journey, scan the QR code on screen now. This screen will also reappear at the end of tonight's webinar. Please also do sign up to Scotland Big Picture's newsletters and to be kept on up to date on all things rewilding. Finally, thank you to our guest panel for joining us this evening and for Matt and Tierney who have been working behind the cameras, uh, making sure everything went smoothly. I think um, we've been discussing the differences tonight between uh, rewilding and ecological restoration, but I think wherever you draw the line between the two of them, if indeed there is a line, it's clear that there's a lot of overlap between these two philosophies and it's also clear that in that overlap zone, there's a lot of great stuff happening and a lot of that is happening here within the Cairngorms Connect landscape. I hope you've enjoyed this evening's webinar. Good night. <laughs>